Hello and welcome everyone to the Indie Football Podcast. As we near two thirds of a century when it comes to the number of episodes that we have done over the last 20 months or so, it gives me immense pleasure in letting all of you know that this episode is probably going to be the closest to my heart. And I haven't said that a lot for, you know, many Liverpool supporters because that's Anukar's job in this podcast. But thank you, Neil, sir, for taking time out and sharing this space with us. How are you and how has life been recently for you? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, to be on the Indie Football Podcast is also a great pleasure yeah. of mine. Not only you know, I love football, Indian football, but um, to be doing this with one of my uh, my students as well. And, uh, and, and now a, a new friend and Anukar, this is great. Uh, life is good. I mean, if I'm looking a little tired, it's because I just came back from a long trip to the UK where I was with you. And yeah, also uh, yes. I was in the US for some time and um, just very happy to be out there with the meetings, but also nice to be back in India as well. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I'm, I'm in a good place right now. Anuka, sir, I think even you have lost count of how many Liverpool supporters have we had in our podcast now, but every mm -hmm. single person's story is almost worth their weight in gold, right? And that's why you love this club so much. Absolutely. But uh, like as much as, as I love talking about Liverpool, today it's about Neil sir here. And uh, honestly, Neil sir, I'll uh, share one thing with you. And I know Doi Pan is going to kill me for this. But like, in a, like we both are of that age where, you know, guys discuss their love interests. But for the past one and a half years, all I hear about is anecdotes about how amazing you are and, you know, uh, how much of a difference you have made in the sports industry. And uh, honestly, like I have uh, done a bit of reading, not just before this episode, generally about uh, you. And like for someone like growing up in Southern California to uh, like I read this interview of yours in which you talked about that uh, one interview in 2002 in New York. It was uh, uh, with the MLS and, you know, how uh, everything changed after that and working with people like David Wright and, uh, you know, like being the director of uh, football uh, development there and making a change coming to India. Like, honestly, if I look at it, like from a very neutral point of view, if you are the Sachin Tendulkar of the sports management industry, considering, so is coming on the Indie Football Podcast like the time when Sachin won the World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> It's, e it's even better. It's even better. I don't know what it felt like for Sachin at that time, but I can. Thank you so much, sir. I am sorry for my grotesque sense of humor, but honestly, uh, thank you so much for coming in. It means a lot for us. And like, uh, like coming to India, changing the infrastructure here, it's like a very Gandhi-esque sort of a journey, you know, when he came from South Africa and changed it in the freedom struggle. So thank you so much for coming in. And we really look forward to doing this episode with you. And uh, of course, having a Liverpool fan here means a lot to me <laughs> because I myself have supported this club for a long time. Uh, but getting to the thick of, thing, thick of the things, uh, Sir, for someone who has supported the club for the last 23 years, like there must have been a lot of moments that, you know, might have defined your fanhood. But what was that one memorable moment which inspired or ignited the great Neil Shah to actually start supporting this great club? Like, what was that one moment? First off, I'm going to cut the first couple of minutes of this and then just put that on every profile and, and share with my, my and, parents. And my also, parents. also before, also before Neil sir, you answer this, I feel I, I've, I've really fallen behind in terms of research because Anukar sir has, has really come up with dates and people you've met and all these things. And I, I feel that I'm underprepared now for this. <laughs> but then, yeah, Neil sir. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Liverpool. So. You know, I, I, as you said, I grew up in Southern California um, in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't very easy to get uh, access to Premier League football in the U.S. Um, there was mostly like M Manchester United TV, so you'd see some highlights. But I, I don't remember watching a lot of um, having access to a lot of Premier League on our regular cable. So it was hard to pick a club that you really love. Um, it's very different mm -hmm. from how you guys grew up, where there was a lot more access to Premier League in, in the time, you know, in your younger days. And so I, in, two, in 1999, I moved to England for one year to study economics at University College London. And it just so happened, one of my new friends who, who lived in the halls, he's from Liverpool, and he had, he had season tickets to Everton, actually. So I used to travel with him and his family members because they had an extra right. ticket. I used to go watch Everton matches around the country. It was fantastic as a California boy. 
didn't get to see a lot of really great live football at that time to go to all these great stadiums in England and watch watch a, a good team in Everton. And one of the matches was at um, Goodison Park, Everton's home ground against Liverpool. And as you know, it's a big rivalry. There's Stanley Park in between these two stadiums and really special experience. And I remember being in that stadium with all the Everton supporters. And there's this one guy just running up and down the pitch, back and forth and back and forth. And at that time, that's the kind of player I like to be in my club team. And that's a player that I would love to be more of. And it was Steven Gerrard. And I was just mm. amazed by his everything. The fact that he wasn't the biggest or strongest, but he was just fierce in terms of his sincerity, his passion, his dedication. He was a leader at a young age, and he was somebody that um, never gave up. And, you know, ever, uh, Liverpool were winning uh, pretty early on. A lot of the Everton supporters left because they were pissed off. And I remember I just, I didn't want to leave. I was just mesmerized by by this person. Um, so that that's what kick-started or at least ignited my my love for the, the club. It continued over the years, and and it, I mean, really, one of the most special experiences I've had coming back to sports management is getting to work with Liverpool uh, on the Liverpool DSK project in 2014, and getting the opportunity to to launch the um, the the academy with Jamie Carragher in, uh, in 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 Pune as well. So, just really, really special experiences with that club. Uh Another thing that I missed out on asking you at the very beginning is as I and Anukar sir were, you know, surfing through different, you know, we we almost did a proper secondary research on you before this podcast. But I was, I wanted to ask you this. Do you have any ballpark figure in mind for how many podcasts or interview shows you have done? And which of them do you vividly remember? Because honestly, I have known even before I spoke, you for the, for, I spoke to you for the first time, I saw at least... Five to six different interviews. There were these GISB lives. There were these different kinds of oh, things. Gosh. So I think I think it's 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 a very deeply entrenched part of your life now, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, I don't even know how to answer these. Yes, I, it is. It is, and I love it. I mean, clearly, I love to talk and I love to share my life with people. And the fact that some people actually care to listen to it is beyond me. I'll take it. Well, there are many. Know, there I, are I, many. I, I, minutes of fame have lasted way longer than they, it should have. Um, but I think that you know the podcast. But I'll, I'll answer this, and I'm trying to, without getting too serious about things. Um, I think in my my career, I've made moves that. You know that maybe have always seen like at the time might have seemed weird like why would you know an indian american gujarati who's everyone's becoming engineers and doctors in our family circles and our friend circles go into professional football it's not even or soccer in america not even like the nfl or the nba and then you know diving deep into that and then moving to india then doing the things i've done in india then going to um you know um uh, you know sports education and how so each move, I feel like I was a little bit, I wouldn't be say ahead, but it was a little bit unique. So it gave me a niche. So I think a lot of times people want to talk to people that are doing something slightly different. And and if you're passionate, enthusiastic about it, you're doing it not for a job, but because it's a mission, I think it also attracts people to want to talk to those people. So um, I, I don't know, somehow or another, I got fortunate. So I've probably done like 30 or 40 or 50, I don't know. But the pandemic, I felt like I was doing this every single day, but we were home all day anyway so it was like this is the best thing i could have been doing right i mean anuka sir it is it is almost like stuff of dreams i mean not to not like not to make neil sir feel old in 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 any way but then i feel even in our generation right now in my life i have had my difficult moments to convince my father to you know get get into this field and for neil sir to do this 20 years down the 20 years before today's time i feel it's it's a it's a trendsetter of times of of his time especially but anukar sir did you know neil sir just like how we have been in some small blog sites but neil sir has written two books and it when one of them is on indian football of course you know about that right Anukar yeah sir. awaiting the blue tigers right like uh, india's yeah. quest uh, for football's holy grail yeah, i have uh, i think uh, sir honestly 
it's great what you are doing here and like i would want uh, to ask questions about your book here like but before i do that uh, i think the approach that you have talked about in a few of your interviews is something which i am very really inspired by because uh, you have talked about something called a relationship focused approach in your interview with grant bahal uh, please correct me if i'm pronouncing the name wrong and uh, thing is that uh, i think that is something which has really worked with the kids uh, with the students who come in gisb also like toy pine for that matter i'll tell you one instance uh, yesterday he and i met for my birthday <laughs> and he was kind yes. enough to come in and uh, he talked about you know making a difference about how building relationships with people who have come on the podcast and i saw a very domino sort of effect when i was going through interviews because like you have often talked about a like as you have talked about a relationship uh, focused approach which you said you know they really helped when you were working back it with the mls uh with people like david right i think that is something which has uh, been transported into the minds of the students at gisb also because i think uh, when doi pai insisted again and again that even though if the podcast doesn't do well for the next 10 years but you are able to build, build that relationship or make a difference i think yeah. that is something which is very big for someone uh, in a generation where we live when everyone so obsessed with money and social media and you know uh, kind of not uh, bringing in that uh, leaf for someone to you know climb up to and reach that level so that is something very admirable uh, but sir uh, like about your time in the mls like i have one question to ask you uh, that considering that uh, you might have learned a lot of things stumbled upon a very different sort of scenario there in the us so what insights from working in the mls uh, helped you uh, when it came to you know approaching sports in india and like uh, what uh, movements from those experiences helped you uh, kind of you know bringing about a footballing culture or a sporting culture here in uh, the tricolor nation Yeah I feel like MLS was the exact training ground I needed at, at the exact right time to give me at least the the lived experiences to come over to India and try to apply some of what I learned and you know I, I think about this is that yeah um, in 2002 when I joined MLS 2002 2003 the league was only 6 years old and 6 yeah. years old um it's it's a kind of a small league at the time two teams had just contracted they you know contracted means they'd gone away there was a couple of owners who owned most of the other teams um the player the, the matches were in these big american football stadiums there's american football lines the tv coverage wasn't very good and the general vibe of professional soccer in america was not very high it was not very positive and so I, everyone around outside of the offices was pretty pretty like um pessimistic about the future of mls and yet when you're in the office in new york city at the time across from grand central there was a lot of like optimism and positivity especially by the executives uh commissioner by deputy commissioner all of them and i just like was trying to soak up one all that optimism but two wondering where is this coming from and the more right. i tried the more i understood is it's coming from a, a great business plan it's coming from a business plan they they thought these things through so they're like the slow strategic approach is going to work and then also very clear strategic focus area so one was controlled spending so if you have controlled spending you're obviously going to not have the best product right, right. off the bat you're going to have happy owners over time you're going to have a sustainable league or at least more chances of sustainability they focused on a strategic expansion so they're going to make sure that the league grows properly with every single time they open up a new uh, franchise in a new city it's done with a lot of thought and a lot of due diligence and three was all about soccer specific stadiums so they said okay right now we're building we're playing in these massive stadiums because we don't have our own but eventually we're going to build our own stadiums and they're going to be great public private partnerships that's going to bring revenue into the the franchises but also raise the valuation as well and create a better yeah. consumer experience so what what did i take from that and then oh you know over the years as, as the years went by and i grew in the league and as the league was growing i was watching this business plan and and in strategy just play out and i was watching it firsthand and i was going to matches where there was only 5000 people and i'm going to matches where there there's 60000 people i'm seeing new stadium in toronto in, in portland and up so when i left mls in 2009 and i came to india i was coming with a lot of belief that 
this is, even if things look dire, even at the time I league was nice at times and people were also like, okay, this league is, where's is it going? Um, I felt like it's okay. As long as we steer the ship in a different direction and we move in a, in a focused way, we're going to see some real progress. So that mm. I was, so I was very enthusiastic and optimistic about the future of Indian football as long as we did things the right way, because I felt like there was certain things in India that we are further ahead than the U.S. Even at that time, in terms of football, the respect that football had in, in India was much more than the respect that football had in the U.S. at that time. The second thing was going back to the relationship side of it. You know, when you were desperate. Like MLS at times were desperate. You know, they needed to fill stadiums. They had ticket sales people. But we realized from the league office, it's kind of the ivory tower. But if you can look at things from a, a distance and not be so, you know, um, desperate, you can kind of think, you can think things through. And one of the things I realized is that if we're transactional as a, as a league, we are, gonna, we are not going to go very far. We, we might go Maybe. far in a short term, but in the long term, we're going to, we're going to struggle because our, we have an inferior product. So the only way we can get people to get behind it is that they have an ownership in this and they feel like they have some stake in the future of professional football or soccer in America. And that can only mm. happen through being authentic, being consistent, being persistent, being collaborative. And you can never feel like just because you're the league office or you're the professional league people, you're more important than the youth football director uh, and some local club. No, those people are been around for long, longer than us. So I traveled around the US spending as much time as I could with the influencers and, 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 and change makers around football ecosystem in America to try to bring them as part of our fold. Not just me, I learned from the best from other people. We all tried to do the same thing. And you can see those relationships are paying off right now as well. And I think the, the the last thing I'll say is ground up. Like we we focused a lot on on working the nurturing the relationships with the youth systems and and the you know grassroots spaces, and that's going to feed the professional league. A lot of times you start from the top down, and I don't think that always works. So I, I you know these are a couple of things that I that come to mind when I think about my time at MLS that I try to in my own way, bring over here through example or through um, speeches or whatever else it might be. I try to do it in India. So again, I ask you one question. Like I know it's like uh, something, maybe do the fans quick you to ask you here, but uh, I cannot, you know, uh, resist myself from asking this question. Uh, so like you raised an interesting point about the US youth system and, you know, raising it from the ground up. Uh, now for uh, like uh, you had also previously talked about, uh, uh, you know, when you were yourself trying to make it as a professional in the uh, US youth system, like before the MLS interview. Uh, so uh, said, I think did that experience help you in kind of, you know, uh, making a certain network or kind of uh, understanding the dynamics better. You mean as I was trying to be a professional? Footballer yes, sir. Or yes. Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, that previous experience did it help you, like as a bureaucrat or someone in the industry later in life? Not, I mean, I would, not fully. Like I would say, not because I was an elite player, all that. That was nice, but what 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 that did for me was a little bit different. It was, um, you know, growing up Indian. In uh, Southern California, Huntington Beach, very white, 19, you know, 80s period, where a lot of the energy was going to surfing and skateboarding and just being cool. And I was kind of in a different world because I was di from a different culture in a lot of ways. My, yeah. my, my, my parents are from villages and towns in Gujarat. My grandparents are literally like farmers. They were living with us at the time in America. Our home was different than my friends' homes who had swimming pools and barbecues and dogs. Ours has had like Mahabharat and Ramayan and, and, and <laughs> like, the and, you know, other, other grand, grandmas sitting on the floor, like eating food with their hands. And so we, our whole, our whole, like I was living two worlds and you know what, what soccer did for me. And I played from the age of four to 18 in terms of like consistently playing at different clubs and, and teams was it gave me a sense of, purpose, a sense of self, a sense of confidence, a sense of being part of something bigger. People didn't see me as kind of a weird Indian kid when I was playing well on the football field. So it, it, it really opened my, my, um, it expanded my, my world in a lot of ways. And it made me feel 
like completely myself. And I think that's where I really, when I think about why I wanted to work in, in professional football in my life, one of the biggest reasons why the sport did so much for me as a, as a, as a human being, and especially as somebody different living in America. And then it did a lot for my parents, my parents who were very different from the Americans that were around us. All of a sudden they're hanging out with all the other Americans at the tournaments in Las Vegas or going to Hawaii. They're, sweet. they're drinking with them or hanging out and partying and, and doing whatever. And they're feeling more American because of my, my, my relationship with this beautiful sport. So I think that's where it made a huge difference more than it elevating me to some elite circles or something like that. Yeah, I think it's it's certainly goosebumps for me because till now, and I would also bring up like some part of the GISB study trip that I just had uh, mm -hmm. in the last week, in the in the last couple of weeks. You know, from from my childhood, I did know that uh, you know sports in foreign countries is different from sports in India. Like like we do lag behind in in many facets, but. Through my experience, and I am also coming from the fact of how Neil sir just shared on how ha having the entire experience of earlier going around with a friend who had Everton tickets, and now later on un un understanding how sports was perceived in in America at that time is for me for this study trip. What it gave me is a is a paradigm shift in how we can have our perspectives set in sports, and mm. uh, and. It, I think what added to the flavor of of our trip was that we did not just go to the best Chelsea's uh, Premier Leagues of the tournament of the football world, which is important, but also then go to a third division uh, club like AFC Wimbledon and understand how inclusive football can be as a sport. And it's so much, I think football is more outside the pitch also sometimes than what it is inside the pitch. So, yeah, I mean, and and to the point that I had asked more questions in the Wimbledon field trip than the Chelsea one. But then I, I I really did enjoy it a lot. But I mean, Neil sir, now I think it is something of a special segment of our episode, not only for you, but also for us, because Anukar sir here has been a writer for uh, many different sites. I had also earlier been uh, been writing. But tell us about your writing journey. Like, where where did it all start? your first book and then now congratulations on your second book getting released and i feel i feel a part of your journey when it comes to the second book because in your self discovery sessions with us i think it was in june you just came and read chapters and and i absolutely felt like a you know starry young a starry eyed young kid trying to understand whoever someone similar to what i want to do in life was coming and sharing his experience so please tell us more about that aspect of your life yeah, no, um, thank you. I, I mean, it's all quite surreal, actually, to be honest, because even when I hear somebody say, oh, you've written two books, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, it sounds like people are talking about somebody else, because sometimes these things just come out of us. Maybe it feels like that with the podcast for you, like it just magically, yeah, yes. it, like you're just going through the motions and all of a sudden you're creating you. things that you can't imagine. Um, you know, for me, it started, I've always loved writing. I, I write a lot of letters. I, I journal almost daily for the last probably 30 years, 30, 40 years, uh, for 30 years for sure. And I've, you know, it's, I've kept a, a, a blog since I moved to India and I have posts from, you know, all the way back in 2009. So writing and reflecting has always been there more nonfiction than fiction for sure. Um, and I remember back in 2017, when I had was working with the, the Liverpool DSK project, I was invited to do a TED Talk. And that TED Talk, they wanted it on um, sports. Like, they wanted me to talk about sports. And I, I thought about it, and I thought about the people in the audience, and I thought, you know what? I don't want to do it on sports. Because if I do it on sports, maybe a couple of people in the audience are going to love this, and I'm going to lose the rest of it. And I've watched a lot of TEDx talks in the past, and I'm like, no, they usually come up with an idea or topic that can connect with a lot of people. So yeah. somewhere along the way, I started thinking about my own journey and things that excite me. And what, And one of the ideas was this concept of superpower, is that we all have something that we are better than at than others. And it, it's something that I feel like I've learned over time that one of my superpowers is that if something has touched, moved or inspired me, I can talk about it for days and I can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and I can create a little bit of interest in, in most other people through it. It's just yeah. something that has been like that for me since I was 
five all the way on to you know forties. So, and then I I ended up recognizing a little bit more of my passion and purpose, and and then I connected it to my career pathway, and I ended up doing the TED talk on that, and it came together. It was fun. It it, it wasn't maybe the greatest TEDx talk, maybe not the worst, but it, it went, and I felt pretty good about it. I, I did another one a couple of years later, which was sim somewhat similar. And along the path way, I just felt like, you know what, I ha I think I have something here. I think, and I started doing these careers and sports talks to help set up GISB. And I didn't want to just talk about a sales pitch and why I joined GISB. So I wanted to offer something to everyone I talked to when I traveled around India. And I offered them a little bit more of this like formula of how do you create a career pathway that's aligned with your natural self. And then the pandemic happened and I just started writing. And a couple of chapters came out and before I knew it, the whole book was done. So that was great because it felt so incredible to have a manuscript done, which I never thought I didn't know anything. So about this is the first book or the second book. This is the, the pandemic. first and second, meaning that the, the one that came, I wrote first, but came out second. And, oh, okay. uh, All right. And, great. I didn't know and this. So, yeah. so, so basically I had this manuscript. I finally, you know, a bunch of people read it. They said, it's pretty good. They gave me edits and all that. <laughs> And, uh, but you know, in the middle of a pandemic to find an, a, a publisher to get an agent was not easy. So finally I got an agent, a lit agent to represent me. And we went on that process and it was taking about a year, a year and a half. I was getting frustrated. I was like, okay, you know, is this book ever going to come out? Should I self publish? And then one day I get a call from the agent and I think he's going to tell me that he's found a really good publisher. And instead he says, uh, this is not about that book. This is about something else. I just got off the phone with the um, chief editor of Own Books. He's a Bengali. He loves football. Oh. His son loves football. He said the word I know someone like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and then he said, you know, he wants a book to come out about Indian football because he says, you know, every four years, a bunch of people in India watch the FIFA Men's World Cup and yeah. they ask the same question why are we not there? Why, how come India yeah. is not there? And, you know, there's the general population who doesn't really know much about where we stand at Indian football and why we're not there. So he said, can you write that book? And I said, is it guaranteed to get published? If I already said it's guaranteed to get published. <laughs> so me, me and uh, my co-author, uh, Gaurav Gala, Gala. Yeah. who is the head of broadcast, uh, FSGL, fantastic person. We wrote that book in a few months. It came out. And uh, it was great. And then, you know, I was, I was um, guided by a friend who's been published a few times by Penguin. And I, he said, Neil, at the right time, when you're on your book tour and, you, and the chief, make the chief editor fall in love with you, basically, or like build that bond and yeah. make him think that, you know, believe in you. And then tell him about the other manuscript. And you'll hopefully get them to publish that one as well. So yeah. what ended up happening was that we are in Bangalore at the Bangalore Lit Fest at a hotel, a show hotel, the main, the main uh, tent, six, and me, Sunil Chetri, Gaurav Gala, uh, Kunal from um, oh. he is head of social, head yeah. of communication, and Shantanu, our chief editor, is moderating. And it's like madhouse because Sunil Chetri, of course. And yeah, yeah. only. And we had a great session did all the selfies everything and then we went to uh we went to the ballroom where our books got sold out me sunil and gora were signing out signing the books <laughs> and and then after all of that madness me and um shantanu the the chief editor were sitting in the writer's uh lounge and he i just said hey shantanu like i have this other book that um i you know it's about a dream career would you be open to like taking me <laughs> <laughs> Such a yeah. Neil is done, and that's how that book happened as well. So it's uh, it's beautiful to have these experiences to get these both out. I mean, Anugrah sir, definitely you have you have yeah. something to share after this wonderful yeah. Wonderful uh, story, right? Sir, uh, is it like uh, like uh, this uh, reminds me of an interview from uh, like a uh, speech from Steve Jobs, where he talked about connecting the dots. Like uh, uh, interestingly enough, I was uh, discussing this with Doi Pan a month back only, in which uh, you know he had talked about. Uh, how he had taken up a course which seemed very insignificant at a time but later in his life it really helped when you know 
he was uh, designing the whole interface for apple and you know working on it and uh, like uh, do you think that the, uh, like when you look back uh, you know getting that first call uh, for that awakening the blue tigers book and you know how it all like do you think it's like a connecting the dots sort of a moment in that sort of regard because you know one thing led to another and like suddenly i got two books which you know are doing well and all like uh, what is what are what is your take on it hmm. My take on this whole thing and my take on life is this, is that you try to try to get to know yourself as much as you can, uh, meaning that try to understand what what makes you feel alive, what drives you. You may not have all the answers all the time, but also be in continuous motion, be in action and and try your best to stay out of your head too much. You can use your head to reflect. You can use your head to protect and make certain moves along the way. But so when it comes to all of this stuff like i live i have a sense of where i want to go of course i have a vision a mission for my life but ultimately i'm also kind of being very clear and aware of what's the signs that are showing up to me on a daily basis and on a weekly and monthly basis so you know when one day when i you know when i was doing those tedx talks and all of a sudden i was like oh a book could come out okay so let me get a <laughs> master class on how to write nonfiction. oh yeah. Oh, he's teaching me how to do this. Let me make an Excel sheet on this book based on this class. Oh, you know what? Let me just start writing it. Oh, you know, now I need an agent. Let me just start talking to everyone I know and see if they can connect me with somebody. Oh, I got this guy. So, and then this opportunity came up. Oh, so it's this process of self-reflection, this process of, um, of action, and this process of just like listening to signs and, and, and pivoting and moving with them. It sounds very kind of floozy or maybe airy, but the reality is I, I think I lived my life like that. And it's weirdly maneuvered me in certain things, ways, and, and it's allowed my world to really feel like a miracle. And it also sounds a bit cliche, but like, you know, 25 or 26 year old me sitting in major league soccer in new york city could have never in my wildest ever dream <laughs> that i live in india and i'm talking to two bright young people like you one of them who's in an institute that i've helped set up back in 2018 and mm -hmm. that we would have just come back from england where we were having uh, one of the most amazing times engaging with premier league and you know football clubs at the uh in england like we're talking about two books that I've written, one about Indian football. I didn't, first time I ever came to it was 2007 when I was 27. Yeah. One book's on my career journey and it's doing well around India right now. And, you know, none of this feels even remotely like it was something that could have possibly happened in my life. But all of it is just because I, I've never looked at the, the return on investment. I've always thought, like, let me just move towards where my mind, my body and my soul are taking oh. me. And, and let me be a good person along the way. I just try to be as good as I can to everyone. And people will take advantage. And people will say you're too nice. I don't care. Because, like, for me, it's about just trying to serve as much as I possibly can in the best way I can do it. And somehow or another, like, the universe always provides for me in that way. Well, if we are doing a brand placement here, then I would say that, you know, these qualities from Neelsa will help you land your dream job, <laughs> considering <laughs> that is the title of the next book. Uh, but sir, uh, uh, like there's one thing I would take the liberty of asking you here, uh, Liberto Sports, like I think uh, <laughs> it's a big a bit funny because I just used the word Liberty. Like uh, you helped, uh, with that, you kind of helped uh, uh, with the business strategies with clubs like Liverpool, like a dream job for me, like I had loved dentistry. I love uh, my patients, but honestly, like working with the likes of Liverpool, Barcelona, yeah. like was someone who has uh, seen the European landscape that way, like, you know, worked with the European clubs and then coming to India with the landscape is like, you know, uh, at the same Hindi, there's like a lot of difference when it comes to it, like it's very different. So uh, how did that hold, how do you see like how different are those two scenarios and how similar they are when it came to your approach in, you know, developing and promoting the landscape in this country? Hmm. I mean, quite different, to be honest, quite different. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you look at the West, where I, I can bring in MLS and I can bring in even the time and experiences I've had with um, working with European clubs, you know, for them, the kind of professionalism that's there. And, and one of the reasons we set up GISB is to help try to close the gap and the kind of professionals. And when I say professionals, 
it, it's it's not just about passion, right? Passion is important. Passion is probably why we're doing this on a Friday night right now. It's because we're passionate. Mm. But that's like, good. One, that's the engine. It keeps you going. But professionalism for me is like business acumen, understanding basic business functions, strategic thinking, decision making. But then also uh, professionalism is integrity. It's 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 like doing what you say you're going to do. It's showing up on time. It's being good with people. Mm-hmm. When I was in working in MLS, when I worked with anybody in, in like the higher levels of sports in America, and you definitely see it in England and, and other parts of uh, in, in Europe as well, most people I was working with, there's majority would have been professional. When I came to India in 2009, there was a lot of passion for football. Um, a lot right. of people, were, they were mostly doing it because it wasn't paying much at that time. But unfortunately, for better or for worse, the, the professional, well, not for, for, for worse, I'd say, not for better, the professionalism wasn't there. That was very right. difficult to see. So that was one big thing that I felt like it's gotten much better thanks to many things, the ISL, DISB, other programs, other agencies, smart people like Joy Bhattacharya and others who are nurturing others, all of that. Two is that, um, you know, I was I was just shocked and saddened actually by the lack of patience that investors had in India for to, to allow something to grow. So when the ISL came or you know, other leagues come in. It's like, let's just throw money at it. Let's bring a lot of important people and just expect that, you know, it to grow at a particular pace to eventually close the gap on what IPL has done. And we're like, it's never going to happen like that. Like, it's fundamentally impossible for uh, leagues to grow that way. So we, you have to, like, slowly build them up over time and do it well and course correct. So, I think one thing that I saw in the West that I didn't see here in India was patience to let something nurture and grow over time. And, and, and I think we've seen a lot of the, the, re- the negative, the consequences of that with leagues yeah. have come and gone, owners come and go. And it's unfortunate. I wish we would have seen more, more of that. And I, I think the, the last thing I'll say, there's many things I could say, but another one that I, I think is really important. And Joy Bhattacharya talks a lot about this as well, and he talks beautifully, is, is this lack of sporting culture. And what I mean by that is this, is that, you know, you go to, like I grew up in, as I said, California. I played high school sports. I played university club sports, but I was a part of a lot of university sporting things. People come out. They watch. They watched my high school matches, yeah. even locals in my, my – we weren't the best. We were good, but they were – they just came. University, they just come. They watch my my kids, like my youth games, parents, friends, neighbors, sometimes they all come. So when you when you go to England and you go to some local matches, a lot of times you see a, like a, a culture around it. And you start coming to matches in India, like even local school games or youth games, you sometimes you don't even see the parents most of the time, at least back then. And yeah. when we talk about building a sporting nation, it really starts with culture. And culture is not just getting more people to play sports. That's one. Culture is getting more people to say, you know what, I don't need to wait for India to play Pakistan to, for me to watch sport. I'm okay with watching the local kids play, um, you know, some, some, some volleyball or football in the neighborhood because I, I want to just support and encourage people to play more. And that, uh, that happens in the U.S. That happens in a lot of parts of Europe. And unfortunately, that wasn't in India. And it, it's, still, it's still only in small pockets in India as well. Yeah, I think that's very interesting that you mentioned this because, again, a very relevant memory from my recent study trip to the UK was uh, this was after the one week that GISB had given us because, mm-hmm. honestly, there was no time during the GISB <laughs> week. We were just packed with so many things. But later on, we I had I had gone to meet a friend in Nottingham, which also, in which also interestingly, Neil, sir, I must tell you that one of our podcast guests, his name is Matt Wilkinson. He worked with Steve Cooper. Who is Nottingham mm-hmm. man? Who is Nottingham Forest's manager yeah. five years nice. ago? And then, and then Matt really took us to the training grounds of Nottingham Fantastic. Forest, and then we saw all, all, all the play, all the players there. But then later on uh, that day uh, in the evening, it was only me and my friend uh, Srajan, whom I just introduced football to. So I just feel great and as if <laughs> I have, I have, I have, I've done a great service to him. But uh, what 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 we did observe is as we go around Nottingham, it's a small place. It's it's mm-hmm. not very big. But the bars, uh, the pubs, 
they sell themselves with the idea of which sport is going on inside they wow. did not speak about the beers they had they did not speak about the food items they had and and it was a recurring theme because nottingham had had many bars and pubs you could see one mm-hmm. every 5 minutes if you walk down a lane and 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 like someone said sky sports live someone said even if there was no football or cricket going on there was racing uh there was horse racing that people were going and and mm. and saying and that is what i felt is that even though i am 23 years old i am very passionate about sports i want to do something in india about sports but this thing of people re- really trying to sell themselves through sport in yeah. india currently people just don't care like even my father he is a cricket fan but then he won't go out of his way even 1% to follow any kind of sports so mm. not that he not that he does not love sports right it's yeah. it's just that and i think uh, i think one thing that i can track it all down to is that india is a developing nation you know people are not so rich enough yet to you know it's it's not about saying that they are not rich enough they just prioritize their finances or attention to things that bring the, their more money and and sports just comes way down the pecking order so that's so that's really. what so that's what yeah, I yeah and that's a beautiful example and i mean it's it's a great it's a great place for us to aspire to be maybe not to have so many pubs in india but uh, to, to <laughs> yeah. have, have a lot of places that see sports as uh you know the attractor to to bring people in yeah. um and you're absolutely right india is a we can't and that's one thing when i'm in the us or i'm in in the uk and i'm making presentations on the indian sports landscape is i'm trying to say you can't compare india and uh, these countries like they're very different so the challenges that exist in um you know india they may not exist completely in those parts of the world but the opportunities mm-hmm. that exist in india you know the the cheap the data that's so inexpensive to some of the yeah. unique the depth the depth of culture to some of the wild stories that you see in some parts of india that i i talk about in waking the blue tigers in terms of the passion for certain sports to the tv viewership of you know an ott platforms where you have yeah. hundreds of millions of people watching like what's what's going to be at india pakistan tomorrow is going to be probably record breaking so that <laughs> kind of stuff is impossible to re- to replicate in in the in the west because we they just don't have the numbers and don't have the access so we have to kind of look at the things that are going well for us and build up with us also sir I think- how much sports yeah anuka sir please go ahead yeah i think that is a very positive way to look at it like because honestly like uh, how you talked about you know using the numbers like the population also for that matter in the right way and uh, sir like a uh, good point you raised up uh, talked about the stories because uh, like we at the nd football podcast uh, like uh, and i think it started from what doi pain once said and like it has become a recurring theme that uh, we talk about the stories that inspire people to do the things that inspire them and uh, like uh, you for that matter sir okay. like okay. I'm, so i so one thing sorry uh, sorry to interrupt neil neil sir you will remember who said this do you do you remember who said this we talked about we inspire the, we inspire others to do things that inspire them the student is being the quizzer here no 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 <laughs> it is it is it is it is from simon sinek in his book uh, ah, start with I why and then favorites. and then so, so yes exactly it. and 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 then i have i have countless times come you know came back to anukash and and even anukash has booked me has has sorry gifted me a book called find your wife from simon sinek so i and anukash keep talking a lot about simon sinek yeah. and 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 you know whatever it is sorry so yes anukash sir please go <laughs> yeah uh, so sir uh, like honestly like uh, uh, talking about footballing stories here i am sure uh, your experiences in india like they must have left you with some interesting anecdotes or some interesting stories so like do share some interesting anecdote or some story some experience that you know you would like to uh, share or discuss with our viewers that you know they really did change their perspective or brought a smile on your face for that matter or oh, there would be many i'm sure yeah <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll I'll tell you one that comes to mind right now. So, um, you know, my my client um, in 2015 at Libero Sports was one of the clients was the Air Force, the Indian Air Force, and they've been organizing um, the the Sabroto Cup um, for you know for so many years, and they wanted 
in 2015, they wanted to bring in like more sponsors. And one of the reasons, the one of the ways that we thought they can do that is by bringing in a big celebrity footballer, like a big name to, to, um, you know, to be part of, to be an ambassador for this, uh, this, this event. And so we talked about a lot of names, Ryan Giggs and Paul Scholes and all of these people that we thought would connect with this youth audience. But because the Air Force was a lot of more elderly people who are running the Sobroto Cup kind of yeah. department at that point, they, they, they were thinking the older guys. And so uh, we kind of mentioned Pele and they said, um, they said, yeah, Pele, well, oh, sure, of course. <laughs> And it just so happened that we had a really good relationship with Pele's manager at the time. So we uh, talked to them and um, we got the price of how much it would cost to get Pele to India in 2015. And we talked to the Indian Air Force and we actually had to go all the way to the head of the entire Indian Air Force to talk to him <laughs> about convincing him why Pele and everything got Great. done. And Pele came to India in October of 2015. My parents had, were coming from America to, because my engagement ceremony, my Roka ceremony was happening um, and they were going to come and actually attend the entire like party in Delhi with my, uh, my future, my future in-laws. And I took them, I picked them up at the Delhi airport. I drive them towards the hotel, uh, I mean, towards the, or my, my place in Gurgaon. And I just stop at the hotel where Pele's at, where my, my team at Libero Sports is working. And I just said, hold on right here. And I didn't tell them what, why. I said, just get some coffee. I'll be back. And then I came down, I picked them up from the lo lobby and I took them upstairs and we walk into Pele's room and uh, Pele was taking pictures of my mom and dad and myself and we're hanging <laughs> out. And my mom and dad know Pele, like in terms of like, they know who he is. They bought me Pele books when I was younger. And uh, it was just such an amazing experience to like my mom and dad coming back to India after the first time in so many years, a place where they grew up, their son is living here. He's brought one of the best footballers in the world into yeah. India, and now they're they're coming to like my wedding, my engagement, but they're meeting him as well. A few days later, my my future wife got to meet uh, Pele and spend time with him, and that really gave me a lot of credibility in the uh, in, in the <laughs> Roka family because their very successful extended family didn't know what a football consultant is or does, but <laughs> knows Pele, yeah. they, they're they're they're. they're you know, niece got to hang out with Pele. So that means that I must be somewhat important. Yeah, I mean, Anukar sir, if we, if we can ever say a story like this or even remotely happening or legendary as the story, I will think I have, you know, I have, I have made it as a podcast host <laughs> anyway. But, but uh, Neil sir, how much sports do you actively follow? Do you, do you get the time or did you watch the Malaysia India game today? Or no, mm -hmm. is it, you know, your life has come to the point that you can only passively check scores and have conversations with people around yeah, you? Yeah, I would love, I'd love to say it's the the former, but it's the latter. Um, and I, <laughs> and I, but I, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to say it. You know, I, I, I grew up surrounded by sport because I grew up in Los Angeles. So I've always yeah. watching LA Kings, LA Lakers, LA Raiders, LA Rams, you know, then eventually LA Galaxy. Anaheim Mighty Ducks, um, LA Dodgers, uh, California Angels. I watched all of it and I was going to games live. I was also uh, watching on TV. My brother and dad are huge fans of everything. So my life was sport. And then I, I worked with MLS. So every weekend I was at a different match. I was watching matches on TV. I was running our fantasy for MLS at the time. So I was watching everything, making sure that the stats team was doing everything properly. So pretty much all the way until I was 30 years old, I was always at live sport or watching sport on TV. When I moved to India, it's like life changed a little bit. I started getting deeper into spirituality. I started getting deeper into like personal development, um, doing a lot more retreats, Vipassana. Um, and in that space, I recognized that my time is so important. And I don't ever want to, I want to maximize my time. You know, it doesn't mean I have to do more. It means I want to be in spaces that I'm channelizing my energy in the best way. So right. I still love sport, but I can't watch sport all day the way I used to because there's some part of me that's pulling me to do uh, other things through the day. That being said, when it comes to certain teams like Liverpool or the U.S. national football team, many of the India matches, um, of course, other big batches, I, I won't miss them. It's fun. It's great. It's like what I love. 
but I'm not watching as much as maybe so much of the other people who work in the industry, just because I, I'm paying attention to the scores, to the stories, to the business of it, but I'm not able to give as much time as I used to. Yeah. Anuka, sir, I think we have time for one last question from your side. We have already exceeded our time limit a bit, but then Neil, sir, is nice. And then probably I sometimes <laughs> extend my liberties as well. So please feel free to ask one final thing or just share any parting thoughts, whatever. Uh, sir, like, of course, like, there will be a separate segment where I share my parting thoughts because I myself have learned so much. Uh, but, like, uh, something I would like to ask you here is what are the predictions for the India-Pakistan match tomorrow? I know it's not football related, but come on. Like, we are... I have an... <laughs> yeah. I'm on the Indie Football Podcast and I'm talking to an American... <laughs> I have I have I have a very interesting story that Pinky Ma'am told me from last batch is that uh, uh Neil sir, Pinky Ma'am and the rest of the batch mates had, had had gone to watch an IPL match, I think. And then Pinky Ma'am told me, you know, how uh, how Neil sir halfway into the game was like, What is going on? And, and I don't want to watch this. I know and, what's and, going on, but I'm just like I, I, yeah. I don't want to like, I appreciate the sport of cricket. I just yeah. didn't grow up with it at all. So let's ask another question. Any other question? <laughs> but yeah, like that I said for the fun part of it, uh, because, you know, the, every uh, India Pakistan match is something which brings uh, us as an indie football, as a podcast, also a lot of traction for that matter. But so yeah, uh, jokes apart, uh, so like uh, you talked about a very interesting uh, thing about a robot ceremony where, you know, you kind of had the love of your life and the the love of sports all combined in the same thing and you know, uh, right on the same day so sir uh, like uh, uh, how do you think that the romanticism of sports uh, like you know how do you think how much is it connected to the fans and how can it be used like we know how click, how we, we are a cricket frenzy country for that matter how the, the viewerships go up when it comes to the IPL or like when there's an India Pakistan match going on so like how do you think we can use that romanticism or the relationship part of that uh, of the uh, you know connecting to the viewers to bringing about a footballing culture in India hmm. yeah now, I can see where your writer comes in as well. The yeah. and this, and you of had course, your yeah. He's that guy, definitely that guy. It's really yeah. nice. I'm waiting for your book to, to come out. <laughs> or your book of poems. Um, yeah. Look, this is this is how I, I see things. Like Because, you know, for so many years, I worked in fan development, fan engagement in MLS. And people always want to ask me, especially when I came to India, you know, how do you develop fans? Like, what did you guys do? And this is at a time where social media, like Facebook, like I worked there from 2002 to 2009. Facebook came out, you know, 2007, eight, or like in terms yeah. of being as popular, Instagram came out much later. So like, it wasn't that we were using social media so much to develop fans. We, a lot of what we were doing was leg legitimately just going on and building relationship with supporters groups, with other groups, consistency, you know, creating reasons, emotional affinity, like ways for them to feel emotionally connected to the, the, the sport or, or the, the club or the league. And, you know, when you talk about this romanticism, one of the reasons I love sports is because as I've grown older in life now, I, and I'm around more older people, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, you realize there's very few things in the life that make us feel alive anymore. Like mm -hmm. as you get older, like you guys are both in your 20s, you're younger, maybe there's a lot of other things that just keep you going, you're excited, whatever it might be. But as you get older, sometimes things start to drop off, lose its excitement, lose its appeal. And a lot of times, a lot of people just become dead inside. They don't really find as much joy in their life. Sports mm -hmm. is one of those things that I see that all over the world, it has the ability to make you feel alive, make you feel connected. Yeah. You go to England and you think about third division football, AFC Wimbledon. It's not the best football in Europe, or it's not, but people will still come to the matches. They why? Because they feel one alive inside of themselves. They it gives them hope, optimism. But two, it makes them feel part of a collective. And we there's all want a to sense feel of like belongingness. Yeah, there's a sense of belonging. We don't. We're we're living in a very isolated. If you watch, you know, if you the the 100 the blue zones on Netflix and how people live yeah. to over a hundred. One of the things is that you want to have something you're passionate about, but two is you want to feel like you're part of something bigger. You're connected to something. 
and sports can provide that. So how does it work in India? Well, you know, like I said, we can't be transactional. We, 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 need to, we need to have, you need to hire some of the best people to be your community engagement people. Is, while you are, you're worrying about signing the right coach, signing the right players, having the right technical philosophy, getting the stadium in depth, you need all of that. That's the given. That's running a football club. But we need to hire very intelligent, hardworking, persistent, good human beings, people to go out and build relationships, use social media content or content to kind of amplify and complement that and, and, and build a five year plan. So we're going to yeah. do this in the next five years and we're going to track it and use data to see where we're at and not just hope like the ad hoc. Let's just hope for the best, throw a lot at the wall and see what sticks. If it doesn't work, we'll try the next thing. Right. That, that takes real courage and real patience and real conviction. But if you do it well, you can see what Bangalore FC has done and others. It's yeah. possible. BFC went into a market that wasn't necessarily a, a known big football market the same way Kerala or you know other parts, Goa and Northeast. But they, they turned it into what it is because of consistency and professionalism and, and you know, understanding the marquee player and doing it well with them or uh, you know, a franchise player like in Sunil Chetri. They've done things well enough to keep so even if the club was not playing well the you know the last couple of years hasn't been as strong as they normally are that core base won't go away and they mm. will easily come back whereas i mean northeast united did really well for a couple of years and then it kind of dropped off and it's hard to get that core base back again and i know mandar is uh, the ceo's trying to do that again yeah. But I think BFC has done such a great job. And there's going to be other clubs. Mumbai City FC is trying to do some really good things as well. If we can see that consistency across the board in India, in Indian football, um, not just at the ISL level, but the I-League level, I know the budgets are smaller. I know the kind of team, the bandwidth of the teams are smaller. I know the season's yeah. a little bit murky sometimes. But if we can see that at different levels, you're going to start to see the culture of Indian football fandom really explode. Um, but it, it like, and I'm hoping that GISB produces many, many more Dwight Bayans who I believe <laughs> has, and now meeting you, Anukarsh, have the, the passion and the, the professionalism and the ability, the creativity, let's say, and the people skills to go out yeah. and do, do this kind of work. Because this is That's real true. grassroots. This is real grassroots work. And it's thankless for a while. But it's really cool because you're traveling around and building, um, building relationships to come back and serve something we all care about, which is the sport and the clubs and the leagues we represent. I think this is this is one of the uh, longest episodes that we have ever done, but also the kind of episode where both of us have been constantly engaged throughout the entirety because i'll be honest sometimes some of the episodes can be a bit of a lull sometimes when we when when, when we, we edit that, that part that, out know. anyway you know, <laughs> I mean, just, yeah. but then but then thank you sir i mean i know i know we have we, we have stretched the envelope a bit when it comes to the time but then I think I think part of the blame is on you because you have been so good in sharing so many different things that we kept on asking questions. Uh, Anuka sir, now is the time when you give a small parting thought and then we we'll let Neil sir go before he thinks, <laughs> oh, oh, oh God, these guys. So, yeah. well, uh, sir, I would want another hour, honestly. And I know Doipan will kill me if I <laughs> take more than two minutes. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, I am. Thank you so much for the kind words because honestly, uh, for something which you know began 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 out of passion, I won't say exactly a passion project, but uh, something which uh, didn't really have a lot of direction when we started it. The indie football podcast for me and Doipan. Uh, we have met people and I think throughout it, we have learned a lot out of them. And it's people, like I said at the start of the episode, it's people like you who inspire us and uh, good luck with the new book, sir. I mean, I'm sure it will definitely do well uh, without any promotion for that matter. They say like the word of mouth is the best marketing, but when you, uh, you know, are able to make that sort of difference, I'm sure like, you know, the word of mouth will spread like wildfire. 
and uh, we might use the last 5 minutes of this uh, podcast where you said some nice things about it in certain ad- ads to you know <laughs> when it comes to uh, promoting the podcast uh, but jokes apart thank you so much sir for taking out the time and for being kind enough to do this me as a healthcare profession i today feel more uh, uh, endowed towards uh, making a, a difference in my industry also because of how towards my own industry in the healthcare industry i myself want to make a lot of difference considering what you have done in the sports industry coming from the us in a very you know a road less taken so i am sure robert frost would be proud of you for that way and we ourselves are very thankful to you for taking out the time so once again thank you so much for coming in to the indie football podcast No, it's, yeah. it's, it's my pleasure. You guys were both way too uh, generous with your compliments and praise. Like I said, I, I some I mostly felt like you're talking about somebody else. Like I don't know. <laughs> um, one thing I want to say, and one thing that's becoming very clear to me about, um, again, about life. Some old uncle talk. I'm going to keep talking to you about, but <laughs> no, it, no, it, no. It, the, the importance of enjoying enjoying what you're doing. And yeah. like I, I've been very. Um, so called successful in my career because i've really enjoyed the projects i work on and the people i get to work with and engage with and what i noticed with you know you, you joked about how many podcasts i would have been on and interviews i've done <laughs> like what i really got from the two of you uh, from the start all the way till now is just how much you're enjoying this process like the research Absolutely. the talking yeah. the sharing the bantering and i i think that if you can keep that into your you know bring that into every aspect of your career and in your lives you will be successful no matter what i mean it's a, this is this is the the dream for all of us so so keep enjoying it and it's fun when you're enjoying it it makes it easier for me to enjoy it as well yeah i think that's a great way to conclude our ep- our episode and then just just like yesterday when i had met anukash we had we had spoken about if it's too early to repeat any of the guests that we have had but i know 6 months down the line if we have these conversations again i am i am going to call neil sir again but then thank you neil sir uh, good night take care and then we will of course always stay in touch thank you, thank you. Thank you so good night and have-